la last night after having dinner with uh, two former students who are now doing a beautiful job at Our Lady of Lourdes in, in their stencil work, which are their designs, uh, I went up to do a little bit of channel surfing and um, let my ADD work for me and just keep my hand on the button. And I stopped because there was this incredible new report that they have found another Bethlehem. And this one is the real Bethlehem, not the one that we've been celebrating for 2,000 years. This one is actually probably the real Bethlehem where Christ was born close to Galilee, much, much closer to Galilee. And it's north of this other city we're probably going to change. Well, I, I hope to confuse you a little more today. <laughs> and so, so fasten your, your seat belts. You're going to be in for a bumpy slideshow. Um, this is Kasha, Italy, uh, where they welcome you to their Bethlehem or their Calvary or their Golgotha or their Jerusalem. Um, Something happened marvelously in this country. And by following St. Rita and who she followed, you will get to Bethlehem, I guarantee you, by the end of the lecture. Umbria, um, as you can see in the smaller map in the upper right-hand corner, is completely landlocked. And it has been called the land of saints, and it, it surely is. This is the... Uh, home of St. Francis of Assisi, St. Clair of Assisi, St. Clair of Montefalco, St. Benedict of Norcia, you can see Norcia just north of Kasha, his sister St. Scholastica, and on and on and on. So Umbria is really the convento of Italy. This is, this is where they manufacture saints. They come from here. Uh, and you, you, you must go. It's just, and, and you will get to these other places, I guarantee you. Uh, and you could notice up at Gubbio, where St. Francis tamed the wolf, uh, and on Assisi, Orvieto, the miracles of Orvieto. So they're, they're all in those confines. Umbria is made up of just both placid and very, very rugged landscape. Um, more about that later. But St. Rita was born into this. She was, she was born, actually, Margarita to a family um, named uh, Lotti, Antonio and Amato Lotti, who were childless uh, for years and, and actually you know, prayed to have at least one child granted to their marriage. And their wish was granted, and they named her Margarita. She was, um, this is actually where she's from, a very, very rugged landscape called Roca Perena. She's not born in Kasha. Roca Perena is a, is a good two kilometers from from Kasha, and because it didn't have a baptismal font, they walked her to Kasha. This is the monastery of, of St. Augustine on the hill. And um, so in 1381, they're, they're granted their wish. Margarita, she was always called Rita shortly after birth, but in that Italian really meant pearl, this precious pearl. Today we, we say Margarita means could be pearl, could be daisy, but this, this pure white thing. Um, it's completely surrounded by the Apennine Hills, so getting from one place to another was an effort, but something willing that both Amata and Antonio would, uh, would do. Um, they were considered the local peacemakers of their town, and that was their job. They would go and make peace between feuding families. St. Rita is born into a time where three people were declaring to be Pope, if you think we have problems. <laughs> and um, this is the baptismal font of St. Uh, St. Augustine, where she was baptized. And would, as a, as a child, exhibited great devotion. They knew there was something very special, even when she was in the cradle. Uh, her family worked the land, and one of their hel helpers one day cut his hand and was running back to the house, and he noticed that in the cradle where, where Rita was, uh, was, was laid, uh, that bees were going in and out of her mouth as the child slept, and he went to wave the bees away, and after he did, he realized that his hand was, was healed, that it had stopped bleeding and the wound was gone. Uh, <coughs> 
And he would tell this story later. Rita led a normal childhood uh, in Kasha, or excuse me, in Roca Perena, and would often go back and forth to Kasha, which was a major urban center at the time and a trade route between Naples and Florence. Um, she received her first Holy Communion in 1390. Um, and uh, this image on top remains important to her. We'll get, we'll get more to that later. Um, the landscape in Roca Perena um, is something very, very particular. As you can see, it goes from this, these very placid hills to these jagged rocks. And um, Francis of Assisi, when he was given this, this piece of, of, of land, the friars were given Laverna, and he contemplated on the, on the structure, the geology of, of his Umbria. Um, according to legend, he, he is visited and he's told that these crags were actually formed not during the creation, but at the moment of, of, uh, of, of Calvary, during Christ's Passion. And um, Kasha, on the other hand, was very, very lush for Rita, and she would go back and forth and often visit the sisters of, uh, at the Augustinian convent. And at that point in time, the Augustinian convent now is cloistered again. But as, as we know, the uh, orders were in, in shift, and some of them that were cloistered were now becoming mendicant and going out. The order of St. Rita, at, uh, the order, excuse me, of the Augustinians at that point in time was doing both. They would remain in the convent, then go out and do corporal works, go back and forth. Um, Rita wanted to join the convent and told her parents uh, that she wanted to join the sisters at St. Augustine's. Her parents, however, had other plans and said, no, you're to be married. We've already made the arrangements, and this is not a good time because of all the turmoil and because of all the feuds that are happening both civically and, and within the church. It's not a good time to enter the convent. And she was very, very disappointed, of course, because she thought her parents, who had raised her to be such a, 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 a good Christian and Catholic, that they would gladly uh, offer their daughter to the order, and instead they declined. Um, Rita was betrothed at the age of 14. This is her wedding ring to a man named Paolo Mancini. Uh, however, according to, to the rule of the time, um, he was not allowed to actually marry her or take her into his home until the age of 16. Uh, Paolo was known to have a temper. Uh, of course, a lot of things, you know, the, Modern accounts would, would like to think St. Rita was an abused woman. And she wasn't. Um, from all the accounts, they know he was a, a, an ill-tempered man, um, not used to working with the land, who had a position as a guard in a tower between Roca Perena and Kasha. Um, perhaps it was a political appointment. Um, some accounts may even say it could have been the feud between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines at the time. However, uh, we do know from, from other accounts that St. Rita was able to temper the man and be patient with him and let him sit and reconcile his differences with these people. And soon, they say, Paolo developed a temperament much like Rita herself. Um, they had two children, two boys named... Um, uh, John Giacomo and Paolo Maria. And they were both born very close in age to each other. Um, their, their father would go, as I said, go back and forth to these, this, this watchman's tower. And on one episode, he doesn't return. Um, this is actually their home in Kasha. <laughs> And she's greeted by uh, men. She knows what's, what's happened. And they take her to the body where Giancarlo had been, excuse me, Paolo had been murdered. What the assassination was about, again, we don't know. What sort of vendetta there was uh, between his family and, and whoever killed him. 
There, here's the tower where he was watchman. Um, however, they took his body back to Roca Perena. Rita is now a very young widow with two sons, two teenage sons, who want to avenge their father's death, which was the normal and noble thing to do. Uh, she prayed vigorously over this and would, would tell them they must make peace. They must make peace with whoever did this, who they don't even know. But they were also afraid that perhaps if they didn't avenge it somehow, in some symbolic way, the same attackers would come to them and to their family. Uh, Rita essentially realizes that these, her children are the same children as, as God's, and they are his as much as they are hers, and therefore puts it in his hands. Within a year after their father's murder, both sons died of the plague. Rita now found herself, at 32 years of age, a widow and someone who has suffered incredible child loss, having both her children taken from her. And she returns to the convent and says, I want reentry. And now, after such, having such a good relationship with the sisters there before she got married, she was rejected. And she was rejected simply because this issue of vendetta had not been resolved. She goes back home. She gets the same message that she is to enter the convent. She goes back to the sisters again, and they said, no. No. Dismayed, she wanders to Kasha, and she visits a church where she sees these images of John the Baptist and St. Augustine. However, she's visited by a third, blessed Nicholas of Tolentine, who had yet been to be canonized. Nicholas of Tolentine was an Augustinian uh, who actually is named Nicholas because of, of his parents having a similar situation. Childless, they went to Bari, Italy, where St. Nicholas of Mira, now St. Nicholas of, of Bari, uh, his, whose uh, remains there, and, and prayed for a child and, and said, if we receive a child, we will name him Nicholas. Um, she went back to the convent again, however, with a different message. She had gone to the families, her in-laws and her own living relatives, and said, do I have your permission to enter, and do I have your vow to keep peace with whomever may, if we ever find out who killed Paolo, will you maintain the peace? And they agreed. And the code was simply this. He who would avenge his brother in anger and spill his brother's blood disowns the blood of Christ. And on that, we have this so-called miraculous entry of St. Rita into the convent. And as we know, in, 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 we see in di different depictions and even the stained glass of St. Rita's, um, she enters with her three patrons, St. John the Baptist, St. Augustine, and St. Nicholas of Tolentine, and she's found mysteriously in, in the convent room. And it's a nice tradition, but the reality is actually much stronger than that. This, this, this woman who would go to these different factions and, and get them to sign a paper swearing that they'd never avenge this death. Uh, this is the room that she was received in, the old choir room, in Kasha, and now, of course, it's, a, it's adorned with paintings uh, depicting these different scenes. Um, Rita entered as, as a novice at the age of 32, um, much older than, than most novices, as we know, and to give her uh, an entry into her new life, because the sisters knew that Rita is going to have to relearn things again. The mother abbess gave her a task, and that was to water this dead twig. She picked a twig up, put it in a pot, and said, water this every day. And Rita simply said yes, and watered it every day. And then a year later, 
something happened. And it continues to happen. It grew and just turned into this wonderful grapevine. And uh, today it's still a tradition where the grapes of Kasha are picked and taken to Rome and offered to the Holy Father. Uh, here's, here's the vine today, still there in the cloistered garden of Kasha. The nuns since then have, have returned to a cloistered life. They're no longer mendicant, by the way. Um, and Rita continued to live her life there as a devout sister, sometimes exiting to uh, help families, especially families in reconciliation, and give what we call the Umbrian peace symbol, which was this Umbrian embrace. And we see it a lot in northern Italian painting during this period, where you've got two factions uh, hugging each other. And it was something that actually Francis of Assisi would institute and uh, instituted and as he would go to these different uh, towns where he was invited. Um, now, people were allowed to come in to the convent, and one in particular, Fra Giacomo delle Marche, was a Franciscan who happened to give a particular sermon on Good Friday. Rita went back to her cell and contemplated on the Passion of Christ and asked if she could be part of it. And she receives a stigmata, um, not a complete one, but a thorn wound on her head. And this is not the crucifix that she received it in front of, by the way, but it is of the period. And it's important that we look at this one because this is also a switch in our... Um, devotional art as, as the medieval crucifix of the Christus Triumphans with the eyes opened. Um, Christ, sometimes even wearing a crown, is replaced with this Christus Patiens, the long-suffering Christ, eyes closed. Gravity has taken over. This is what actually leads us into um, the, the Renaissance, if anything. And it, again, comes out of Umbria, these first crosses are designed in Umbri and become a product of um, Franciscan spirituality. Um, Rita could no longer return to Rocca Perena uh, with this, this stigmata for, for a few reasons. One, the Mother Abbess did not want people using her as a freak or a spectacle. And also, it was recorded that the wound gave off um, an obnoxious odor for those who would get too close to her. Um, so Rita was pretty much con confined to her cell, um, longing to get to her scoglio, where, where she would do most of her meditating in Roca Perena. Um, the sisters were planning a trip to leave Kasha and go to Rome for the Jubilee year, and Rita wanted to join. And again, Mother Abba said, Rita, I don't think you could make the trip because of the stigmata. It'll actually take attention away from this jubilee year, and we don't want that to happen. She understood. But shortly before her fellow sisters were to leave, the stigmata disappeared. And Rita gets to Rome, and she celebrates the jubilee year, and also witnesses the canonization of one of her patrons, St. Nicholas of Tolentine. Uh, and she knew that she had to be there to give thanks to this, this saint who had led her into the convent and, and cleared the way for her. On the way back, after leaving Rome, back to, uh, to Umbria, her, her fellow sisters notice that the wound has reappeared. And she goes back to the convent uh, to live out the rest of her days. Often, relatives would come to visit her there, and on one occasion, she asks for figs from her garden. They ask her, is there anything I could bring you? And she'll say, bring me two figs from the garden. But it was winter. Um, Rita has a strange way of asking th for things when it's impossible to get them. <laughs> and I think that's why she allows people to ask her for things that are impossible to get. She knows what it's like. Um, and sure enough, there are these two figs remaining, leafless tree on the branch. And um, they're brought back to her. Uh, as her health starts to decline, 
Rita really exists on Eucharist alone. And in January of um, 1457, a cousin arrives again, and she realizes Rita is, is, is very sick. And she says, is there anything I can do for you? And um, Rita says, no. Is there anything I can get you? She says, no. And on leaving, she realizes how dismayed her cousin is that there's nothing she could do for her. So she says, yes, there's one thing. And you can go to my garden in Kasha, in, in Roca Perena, and bring me a rose. Well, now her cousin's even more disappointed because in Umbria, it snows. It is, and I, I, I can tell you, there's snow on the mountaintops in May during her feast, so it snows. She goes back to Roca Perena and finds the rose and brings it back to, to St. Rita. And in that May of of 1457, May 22nd, Rita is reborn to eternal life. This is her scolio where she would go to pray um, as legend. And this is May, so you can see the snow on the hills in the background still. Um, the bells began to toll without any, any human hand, calling the people of Kasha and, and the uh, towns below to come and see the saint. Um, or Rita, as, as uh, Margarita, as she was known then. Because sainthood doesn't come to St. Rita for quite a while, as, as we find out. Um, she was beatified in, in 1627, and somehow remains in paperwork for a little too long. Um, her miracles were known throughout the entire country and depicted but we don't see St. Rita a lot in some of what we call the higher periods of Catholic art. There is no Renaissance statue of her. There's no Baroque statue. There's no Neoclassic. She missed all the big high points. Um, as you can see. Uh, but nevertheless, Kasha became associated with the saint, and the saint, because of her ability to, to not only... Uh, intercede for impossible cases, but also be of assistance and reconciliation was known throughout the entire country, both north and south. If you know anything about Italian geography and its people, north and south are very, very north and south. And um, most southern Italians who knew of St. Rita, who emigrated to America, would have never gotten to Kasha because of poverty, because of lack of ability to get there. In 1907, however, the Augustinians of the province of uh, St. Thomas of Villanova decided to open uh, or build the church of St. Rita of Kasha. Uh, only seven years after her canonization by Pope Leo XII. So they jumped on it right away and built a magnificent, uh, actually high Renaissance building by George Lovett. And I'd say this is probably Philadelphia's best example of high Renaissance revival architecture. Um, and I say high Renaissance because of the inclusion of the volutes on the side, which are really more of an Albertian thing. And also we see in the Jesu in Rome. So this has a bit of both Renaissance and, and Jesuit Baroque here. Um, if you haven't been there, you should, you should get there just to, if anything, just to see the the, the wonderful um, ecclesiastical architecture, complete mosaic floor. Um, often when people come into St. Rita's for the first time, they say, why, it's hard to believe why, why anyone Catholic would say this, but why is there a Jewish star here? Um, so we slap them a couple times and then <laughs> remind them of this Old Testament, New Testament, you know, <laughs> Judeo-Christian. Okay. Um, <laughs> And adorned with wonderful stained glass, um, this one showing the expulsion from the garden. Is, this is a very, very unique image because it not only shows the expulsion of the garden, but the promise. There's the Immaculate Conception. You know, all in terms of, of simultaneity. And this is something that I, I think if there's anything that happens in um, Catholic art is that it crosses time. 
and it crosses place, and that um, we have all these different things that can happen um, in one place. As, as we say, Christ wasn't born, Christ is born. So that's why if they find this place where he was born, it still won't matter. Um, but as you can see, it's, it's a beautiful circle, square, Renaissance tradition. Um, and wonderful, I, wonderful because it's not, uh, as you can see, it's definitely not a modernist structure. Um, there's nothing squat about it. This is, uh, this is Iglesia. This is the bride, well adorned, waiting for the groom. And in the sacristy, there was a painting that I recognized, even though I, had, I, was, I was not a parishioner of St. Rita's, but after my grandmother died, I was given all her sort of religious stuff. And in her postcards, there was a black and white postcard of this painting that I had never seen before. Uh, my grandmother wasn't from St. Rita's. We're not from South Philadelphia. However, it's a painting from a woman's group of Venafra, which is a very, very small town in the middle of nowhere in southern Italy. And they would meet at St. Rita's. And this was a very, very common thing. What, what actually happens here is in 1907, this surge of Italian immigration is coming into the United States and into Philadelphia and in South Philly. Why St. Rita becomes such an attraction, why she's such an inspiration is because she is a mother. She's a widow. She suffered child loss. And she's a religious. So there's, there's not one aspect where both men and women and children and, and anyone who's actually lost anything couldn't identify with her. Um, these are the three patrons of, of this, this town. You can see on the bottom it's written, uh, the, the, the women of Venafro. So they would have these, these società meetings, and they weren't very uncommon in a lot of uh, immigration societies where the patron would be a certain saint and they'd meet here. Um, here's the pastor, Father Michael. We have novenas. We have the triduum for, for St. Monica and St. Uh, Augustine in August, and the veneration of relics becomes very, very important in, in Italian-American society. Um, some people say because we're touchy. Uh, I don't quite agree with that because I think that that's a universal. Uh, I see Muslims touch their head to the ground. I see Jews kiss a, kiss a mezuzah as they enter their home. So I think this idea and this, this uh, realization of, of touching something uh, is quite important to all cultures. <coughs> I think there's, there's a greater aspect to this, though, and that it fits into one of the three things that I think are important to both a devotional life and devotional art. These three aspects of presence, witness, and transcendence. And if the first two, if either one of the first two are missing, the third doesn't happen. You cannot get to the transcendence unless you're willing to be present to the situation, or you make an art form that has a sense of presence to it, which means all its parts and all its members must say it is here. It must be recognizable. It has to be witnessed in the sense that it must be inclusive to the viewer. I cannot have empathy for something that doesn't recognize what it is and what it's feeling whether it's a play or a novel or whatever, that the empathy factor must be there. And we see in all our great art and architecture that if it doesn't have empathy somewhere within what's being depicted, we can't feel it either. Uh, this is a, um, a reliquary, uh, one of the reliquaries at St. Rita's, um, 19th century bas-relief, where people come in and write notes. They write petitions and put them in a basket asking St. Rita to intercede. There's the choir loft with this wonderful uh, stained glass window of um, Leo XII and the canonization of St. Rita. Here is the window depicting her miraculous entry into the convent. And it is, it, what, like I said before, it was miraculous considering what, what her obstacles were. 
and here she is being led by her three patrons. In 2000, St. Rita celebrated 100 years of sanctity, 100 years of sainthood. And on the occasion, her incorrupt body was flown to Rome. Now, story about St. Rita and being incorrupt and her urn. After she died, the townspeople of, of Kasha wanted to pay their respects and see Rita one last time before she was interred. And the lines kept going and going and going, and another town would join, and another town would join, and another town would join. And what happened was she never got buried. So they just change her clothes every once in a while and keep her in an urn. Um, but they actually helicoptered the body in to Rome, uh, to the Vatican, where uh, the Holy Father uh, had a special celebration and added Rita to the universal calendar of the church, May 22nd, year 2000, and said that Rita was someone who both loved and suffered and she suffered for the love of Christ, and she suffered at the hands of, of mankind, who she loved. And here's the Holy Father praying at the, the foot of the urn. Now, this presented a problem for the National Shrine of St. Rita of Kasha because we wanted to join the celebration of, of the, um, the centenary and also save the parish, which was really on decline. The shrine has always been much stronger than the parish, although at one point in time the parish was incredibly strong when you think of 20 baptisms a week during that period of immigration. That's a lot. Um, and it was decided that we would renovate the lower church, which was being used as a shrine, but if you had seen it before, it, was, uh, it had been, uh, as Michael Rose says, ruinated in the 60s. And uh, it was decided that we would use this image of Christ of Holy Saturday. And as I said earlier, during the um, uh, showing the, the wooden painted cross, it, it's been recorded that perhaps St. Rita received the stigmata in front of this image of Christ of Holy Saturday. This is her, her wooden coffin, by the way. And when I first saw it, I thought, that can't be. It's, the paint's too... It's, I didn't know she had never been buried. So I thought somebody retouched it. No one retouched it. It just never went into the ground. Um, and there she is between Mary Magdalene, and she's on the other side holding a single thorn with the Cristo di Sabato Santo, the Christ of Holy Saturday, this resurgent Christ who is still a man of sufferings, not resurrected, but not dead. Um, in fact... It can be said that this is probably the more prevalent art form in northern Italy at the time over the crucifix itself. Here it is by Fra Angelico over the tabernacle door in the cell of Cosimo de' Medici in um, the San Marco convent in Florence where Cosimo would go with the, with the uh, uh, Dominicans and just shut himself off for meditation. They gave him uh, his own cell in their own uh, cloister area. And here is, again, the, the um, coffin lid of St. Rita. Um, this is a drawing I did in preparation for the shrine, and it was decided that this should be in relief. Um, and a relief that, this is a, a, a clay of, of uh, detailed clay before it was in bronze. Uh, that the relief should hold no perspective. Now, this is something that I think is one of the richest things in, in Catholic art, and that is the use or non-use of perspective, where we can sustain a moment, we can, we can keep a distance uh, or, or maintain a distance by, by not showing anything diminishing. Um, it's something that we see in, in, of course, orthodox icons where there's no perspective, where it's either parallel or even diverging because these things don't diminish in, 
in divine space. So in order to create this divine space or, or, or portray it in some metaphorical way, we don't use perspective. This is a, I, I, just a little bit about process. I go from clay to plaster to, to, to wax to bronze. This is the plaster version of the sculpture. And that's it in situ where um, the marble, uh, and I also noticed in, in a lot of these depictions, the, the sarcophagus facade was always dealt differently than the image, whether it was painted or sculpted. And we sort of maintained that. Um, and copied the, uh, the mantle behind from St. Rita's coffin lid. So this is at the entry downstairs when you come into the lower church, lower shrine area, with the original baptismal font um, in front of it, which for some reason, we, we don't know, St. Rita's baptismal font was always in the lower church. Perhaps following, um, again, uh, uh, an Italian tradition where we see how the baptistry was a separate structure, as we see in Florence and, and Pisa and, and these, different country, uh, these different cities, that you, weren't, you didn't enter the church until you were baptized. So you were baptized in a different structure. But this structure was, was uh, usually... Um, one of the most beautiful things, along with the, uh, with the bell tower, that these are three separate structures. So baptism was, was uh, not to keep you outside as much as to, to, to show the importance of the entry into the church. And, and here we have the alignment between um, uh, the Christ of Holy Saturday and the sacramental. Here's a uh, detail of the bronze. And... This is not an Italian, this is a Filipino woman. So they do it too, don't blame us. Um, but I, what, what's the wonderful thing here for me as, as uh, the artist is to see how people come in and don't look at it as art. And to me, that's, that means that uh, for devotional art not to be seen as art and to surpass its own artifice is what it's about. Uh, if we get stuck at the artifice and just, you know, um, then it can't be very, we can't witness. We can't witness. The bigger problem, though, for the shrine was the depiction of St. Rita herself because, and here she is um, in the Church of St. Francis, which is in Kasha, um, which was the tradition at the time to do an add-on. And this, by the way, this, this idea of putting saints in with the virgin and child also comes from Umbria and an art form that we call Sacra Conversazione, sacred conversation. Right? And if we look at earlier artwork, um, usually there's a predella and the saints are below and they're, they're, they're minor and they're smaller. But after, and we can mark it, after Cimabui depicts St. Francis of Assisi, Next to the Maestà, it changes everything. Everything. We are now invited in on the same, with a blue background, not a gold background, a sky, landscape, uh, reconciliation with creation. So here's this very early depiction of Beata Margherita, Blessed Rita. Um, here again, this is still during the period of her uh, being a, a blessed and, and, and not canonized. Um, with her three patrons. And here's the 19th century Florentine depiction. And this pretty much stays the rule from 1900 on. She's always in the 1900 Augustinian habit, holding a crucifix, standing, or sometimes kneeling in a painting, but in no statuary. And the statues are very, very, you know. We have to look at that whole period of, of polychrome plasters and, and where they came from and why they came, uh, why, we, we, um, why they came into being. And most of it is because as the immigrant church was growing so rapidly and the immigrants did not have the means to make them themselves, nor were they commissioned to, often they were just purchased from catalogs like this, you know, holding a book and pen because they wrote the order and that's it never did anything, and easy for shipping. See this? Easy for shipping, <laughs> all right? And, um, and, and easily mass-produced. So um, 
St. Rita fell into that category, uh, I decided when commissioned that I wanted to look at something else of her period, and that was uh, Bolognese terracottas, and in particular, the women of the lamentation, witnessing the lamentation of Christ, uh, or witnessing the uh, deposition of Christ, um, that if I had the static moment of, of Christ of Holy Saturday, that there would be a dynamic moment in which re- St. Rita receives the stigmata. Um, and again, to give it the sense of ongoing. So uh, here's the clay model of, of uh, St. Rita being done here. And, uh, oh, Petita, you remember when the arm fell off that day? Yeah, we had, uh, <laughs> that's why there's the prop here. And this is, this is the back, so you can see the drapery. I heard that if you take this image and you put it upside down and put it in a mirror, you'll get the Isben number for the Da Vinci Code. <laughs> um, yeah, it's true. I haven't tried it yet. I haven't tried it yet, but it's supposed to work. And, and here's the bronze uh, in, the, in this octagonal uh, environment. And here she is in front. I also wanted something from any view, some offering from any view, uh, where if, if someone were behind uh, the statue, and um, to see this view of, of, of St. Rita in front of the resurgent Christ, it would all be there. And again, enter into this three-dimensional sense of sacred conversation, where her patron, John the Baptist, will be in one of the niches when, uh, when we get to that. Hopefully, this will be finished by 2007, which is our centenary year for the shrine. Uh, another reliquary of St. Rita below, or excuse me, uh, outside this um, uh, octagon. Um, St. Rita wanted her friends with her. This is another Augustinian blessed, blessed Stephen Bellicini, um, who was from Genizzano, Italy, or was stationed there where he had a, a particular devotion to an image of Our Lady of Good Counsel, which is depicted above. Uh, when the church was built, and there's angels carrying this icon uh, to Genizzano, Italy, um, since the church that had been painted was taken over by the, by the Muslims. This, this fresco gets very small, but gets transported miraculously to Genizzano. I was commissioned to do this about 20 years ago um, by two people out at St. Genevieve's when the Augustinians were at St. Genevieve's. I had never heard of Blessed Stephen Bellicini. Um, I read up on, on uh, the Blessed, and um, learning of his special devotion put this, this, this um, cherub there holding the icon. Um, new to the neighborhood, uh, I, to St. Rita's, I noticed that there was this little book in, in the uh, uh, gift shop there, and it said... Uh, the Life of Blessed Stephen Bellicini by Michael Di Gregorio OSA. And I said, did you write that book? He said, yes. I'd never met anybody else who had known him. And uh, I said, I did the statue. And he said, you did the statue? I said, yeah. Because it's the only statue that exists. And a year goes by, and I bumped into Father Michael in the street, and he said, is there, is there a copy of that, or did you have a mold? And I said, why? He said, because I'm bringing his relics from Genizzano, Italy, and I'm going to put them in the tabernacle below the image of Our Lady of Good Counsel. And we don't have anything. I said, no, it was, it was a one of a kind. Um, and then about five years later, I read in the Inquirer that the Augustinians were giving St. Genevieve's back to the archdiocese and were leaving to go to separate missions. And we called up and said, what are you doing with the statue? And they said, leaving it. Come and get it. So... Um, we brought it to St. Rita's where it's, it's been sitting in front of the uh, reliquary ever since. Also in the year 2000, the uh, sisters gave us the pillow that St. Rita rests her hands on in the urn as they replaced it with, with this new one for the centenary 
Um, and often you'll see people, and this is also in the, in the uh, shrine area, people put their hands on top of the glass at St. Rita's. Um, the next part was the Eucharistic Chapel behind, uh, or at the, at the uh, head of, of all this, which is actually below the uh, uh, sanctuary above. And since we wanted Eucharistic adoration, and we wanted some, something that would allow us to do both, uh, have, have something that could be uh, used as a tabernacle, something that could be used as a monstrance, um, I designed this, this wreath, the surround of the seven fruits of the Promised Land. And, um, and as we know, the Eucharist is the promised fruit. It is all of them together uh, under, under the species of bread and wine. So this is what it looks like with the, um, it's, there's a, a panel door that, that is, of course, closed during, uh, during liturgy, and with the same motif as on the Christ of Holy Saturday, where it's a cruciform nimbus, and then open for exposition. That's some of the detail. Next, we um, decide to include really the, found, the uh, foundation of the basilica in Kasha. Um, Beata Teresa Fasche was almost uh, uh, out of the picture in the sense that she also tried to get into the convent in Kasha three times and was denied by the good sisters. She was from Genova and from a very, very uh, upper-class family, well-educated, um, could read and write, and the sisters said, you know, Kasha's tough. It's cold. It's rough here. We don't have, we don't have anything that, you know, you're used to a comfortable life. You couldn't possibly make it in Kasha. And she said, no, my calling is to be in Kasha. I have to be there. Um, and finally, they let her in. And the mother, uh, she became the mother abbess and built the basilica that we know. In fact, the basilica in, uh, in Kasha uh, postdates the uh, church of, of, of St. Rita in Kasha in Philadelphia. Um, wasn't built until 47. She opens up a, um, a hospital, an orphanage for girls, teaches the sisters how to read and write, and uh, really establishes Kasha, which had fallen into decline, um, as a quite a center again. So what's going to happen is these uh, saints and, and, and Blessed Teresa will all witness together Rita receiving the stigmata. And there's her relic on the side there. Um, in 2004, St. Rita's was, was named um, the twin parish of the Basilica in Kasha. And each year, uh, the Basilica in Kasha chooses another St. Rita church somewhere in the world. This is the first time a church in North America had ever been chosen. And in celebration of that, we, we had planned some mural, but this, this time uh, it gave it a little bit more importance. Somehow St. Saint, uh, Saint Rita, um, in the act of reconciliation, um, this is a mural that uh, uh, we started last December, right after Christmas, um, this is the underpainting, the grisaille, and this is the color version. Um, and again, it's St. It's Rita out of time, out of sequence, nothing linear here, uh, with all people at all times of all different wars, of all different cultures, um, offering the olive branch somewhere between Kasha and her Roca Perena, uh, exchanging uh, the olive branch for weapons. I'll just take you through a series of details here. Simon of Kasha in the background, who is also uh, an inspiration to the saint. And reconciliation even for religious. We have Cistercians, Franciscans, and Dominicans, all, all giving the peace embrace. <laughs> Um, venerable um, Thomas of, uh, of St. Augustine, the samurai, 
who was an Augustinian who had to disguise himself as a samurai, uh, and her three patrons at the base there, Augustine, John the Baptist, and Nicholas of Tolentine. And there you get a, an idea of, again, this sacred conversation uh, in the round that will be happening. We were invited to participate in this twinship with Kasha. Um, this is Roca Perena, from, as viewed from St. Rita Scoglio. And um, a group of us went over. Uh, my first time to Kasha, and uh, quite a memorable experience. Um, it begins on the day before the Feast of Saint, on the 21st, where, where all these different factions, there's the mayor of Kasha, uh, and the banner of St. Rita, this one here, from Philadelphia. Um, and of course, it starts with great fanfare, since this is her hometown. Um, so the uh, Alfieri, the flag uh, throwers, uh, start the, this, this procession that goes on from dusk until, um, or late afternoon until evening, uh, where all these different groups walk the way to Kasha um, and um, await the torchbearer. Now, we were very, very fortunate at St. Rita's this year because one of the conditions uh, for participation in this gemelaggio, this twinship, is that you have to nominate a woman who you feel is, should be the recipient of this, this uh, declaration, of this uh, uh, award of recognition for her work in reconciliation. And you have to have a torchbearer who will run from Roca Perena to Kasha, carrying the torch that was lit in Philadelphia. when They, they came over here in April, actually, and, um, to start the whole thing off. And one Sunday... Out of the blue, this young woman walks in and says, I hear you're going to have a trip to Italy. And I um, said, yeah. And, and we said, do you know anybody who can run two kilometers and carry a torch? She said, yeah, I could do that. <laughs> so, and because she, she, was a, she was an avid runner, and she signed up. And um, with this, this great um, parade of people, and she's the last one, and you could just hear the crowds from, from these different hill towns. The whole place is lit up with candles. She's coming up this, you know, and they're all applauding uh, and bells are ringing. And then she hands the torch to that good-looking young man there. Um, who, I did not expect this at all. I did not. This was, this was uh, a, a real treat where um, they said, would you like to light the torch in Kasha, uh, which was a great, great honor. Um, and then the next day it starts, the procession to, to celebrate um, St. Rita passing from death to life begins. And of course, you get in line here behind the cross. You get in line here with every little faction, every neighboring town who processes up to the hilltop of Kasha. And now I find this particular, uh, a particular interest uh, to Italian devotion, where it's not an imitation and it's not seen that way, that this little girl carrying the box of bees or the one behind her, all these different people dressed in different aspects of the saint's life um, feel a special participation. This again has something to do with presence, witness, transcendence. Um, those who are chosen to portray St. Rita as, as a married and her spouse, Paolo, her two her two children, St. Rita as widow, followed by St. Augustine, St. John the Baptist, um, Giacomo of Delle Marche, the one who makes this impression on her the day she receives her stigmata, um, her cousin bearing the figs, uh, her cousin bearing the rose, the single rose, and then all the noblemen of the, the, uh, the uh, surrounding towns. And this is all going on with, with, with groups singing, with 
every bell of every church going, going full blast all morning. Uh, the procession takes a couple hours. And then everybody, everybody brings roses to St. Rita. She asks for one, she gets thousands, thousands. And it just keeps coming. What I find is, is that Italian devotion has somehow gets confused between art imitating life, imitating art, imitating life, imit- and it just goes, and you don't know where it begins, that, which is wonderful. Um, and then the rosary societies come, all bearing the uh, symbols of the different mysteries. And finally, we get up to the hilltop where the basilica is. Um, the man in the, uh, with the uh, banner, uh, excuse me, the, the, the tricolor here, is the mayor of Kasha. And in procession, he asked me, um, when you do this in Philadelphia, does your mayor come along? <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> I'll tell you, it was, it was a miracle even to fantasize John Street that day. <laughs> But um, anyway, we get to, we get to the uh, front of the basilica, and as far as I can see, as I said, are, are thousands of roses waiting for St. Rita. And once inside is when the liturgy begins and the celebration of these women uh, who have to be recognized for their ability to make re- reconciliation. Now, the two women that Kasha recognized were um, Robbie, who's in the orange, and Sarah, who's in the, in the um, uh, hooded jacket. Um, Robbie's a, an Israeli woman whose son David was shot by a Palestinian sniper. He didn't join the army. He was, he was of course, drafted. Uh, and he said to his mother before he went, I want to show them what a good Jew's like that not all Jews hate Palestinians, and maybe I could do something here. When David was, was shot within six weeks of his entry into the army, Robby said, she got on national TV and said, not one drop of blood in his name, not one. It's to stop here. And she decided to call Palestinian women who had lost sons, brothers, and husbands. Sarah lost her husband, and she said, we have to talk. This has to stop. Six million Jews aren't going to go away. Palestinians aren't going to disappear. And they started this this family-to-family circle uh, where they would call anyone. An Israeli would call a Palestinian. Palestinian call an Israeli. Give them your condolences. Tell them you know what happened. Tell them you know what it feels like. So both women were were honored... uh, with the St. Rita Award of um, uh, Recognition that day. Uh, our nominee from St. Rita of Kasha here was Mother Agnes Donovan, uh, fa- co-foundress with um, Cardinal, uh, Cardinal O'Connor of the Sisters for Life. And um, I don't know if you know of, of, of uh, Mother Agnes, I'm sure Dr. Haas does. Um, what a wonderful companion on the trip. Um, but uh, the order is founded for, for saving children, of course, and to assist women who are in pregnancy and their, and their uh, boyfriends or husbands, how to take them to term, and also reconciliation for women and men who have suffered abortion. Um, so definitely a woman who is very familiar with... If, with child loss of others, they all offer their roses that they're given to to the uh, uh, to their inspiration, Saint Rita. And um, her inspiration is something that, again, I, I have to say, is very Umbrian, as she decides to follow Christ as did her fellow Ombrian, Francis of Assisi, uh, as her sister Claire, Claire of Montefalco, does by receiving uh, the cross actually in her heart. Um, 
and again they get in line behind it. Um, they do something like the living station. This is a very common Umbrian thing. Um, after all, this is the place where the stations as a devotion were developed or during the Portiuncula uh, indulgence where St. Francis, in a move to stop the Crusades, or stop people at least from signing up for the Crusades for this indulgence, says, why can't they visit uh, Jerusalem here? And for the one day of the year, Good Friday, uh, he was granted his wish, and that the state, the, um, uh, instead of visiting, though, for those who couldn't visit the Holy Land, uh, they would visit Assisi. Here we have the penitence of Kasha, in Norcia, the station of the deposition. So you go from town to town to witness these different stations. And the same angel who tells you that the tomb is empty will also be used to announce it to the shepherds to go to this manger. Uh, and they'll, they'll again process the, um, the, the Presepe, the Italian crib, is also an Umbrian invention, again through Francis of Assisi. So we have two things that, that come out of this, this, this one territory, aside from the saints themselves, is the manger and the stations of the cross. And again, this, this living participation where we, we don't uh, seem to have a strong line between art, artifice, and imitation and participation uh, this is a Neapolitan presepe, um, living nativity. So I thought we would end not with, with since it is the last Sunday of Advent, that we could finish with this wonderful uh, expose of both precepte that are man-made and precepte that are acted out uh, in all these different hill towns in Umbria. And no precepte really would be uh, uh, finished without the hag. And the hag, the vecchietta, holds a very, very special place in, in Italy because she, after all, is La Befana. Now, La Befana, they don't, since they do have St. Nicholas of Bari, who's the real St. Nicholas, they don't have Santa Claus. But they have this other personage, La Befana. And La Befana, uh, it's a play on the word epiphany also. La Befana was visited by the Magi. They stopped at her house on the way to whichever Bethlehem they went to. Um, <laughs> and... She said, where are you going? They said, we're, we're going to see the newborn king. We're going to see the Messiah. And she said, oh, I'd like to go with you. And she said, but first I've got to clean my house. <laughs> they said, you don't have time. They said, no, 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 I'll, I'll catch up with you. Go ahead. I'll catch up with you. Hence the broom, by the way. This is, she's not a witch. Don't confuse. This is not Halloween. I haven't gone crazy. This is Christmas in Italy. And by the time she gets to Bethlehem, the manger's empty. The grotto is, is, is barren. And she stands there with her broom and says, what do I do? And she says, I know what I'll do. Every year this time, I'll go to every child in the world and bring them a gift. And t maybe, maybe it'll be him. So that's, that's La Befana. And of course, there's got to be children and there's got to be food. Uh, this idea of, of Eucharist table food doesn't, uh, has to be included also with the nativity. You know, it's not uh, just something. And here we are in Kasha with all the women at the table, you know, uh, discussing reconciliation. This was a wonderful, wonderful event. Um, and finally, Robbie, the, the Israeli woman, said, we spend so much time at the table in English. She said, but there's something about this. Things get worked out at the table. <laughs> and of course, the musicians, both, both art and actual, actual and implied. Um, again, that, uh, that strange balance with La Bifana, 
uh, or a couple of them actually, you can see in the crowd there. Neapolitan crash uh, musician, actual Italian bagpipe player, very, very common tradition here. Um, the, the bagpipes start the first week of Advent and go through all the different towns uh, announcing that it's coming. And this is, this, we don't know how old this tradition is of the shepherds coming into town announcing uh, the coming of Christ. Mother and child, um, the lactating virgin, played off by another, another woman. Again, the same scene in Kasha. Again, uh, this, this reconciliation of, of all different people at the same time and place. So, I invite you to Bethlehem via Kasha, via 1166 South Broad Street, whatever your pick. But thank you so much for coming out today.